I've got here a plaque that was made for me by Evan Borman. Evan is one of the sons of, of Rick Borman. Rick, the son of Bubs and Bobby Borman, who our church has supported for many years, uh, missionaries in Ecuador. Evan made this, it's a piece, a branch from a eucalyptus tree stump. So this, the tree was massive. This is one of the branches. He cut it and varnished it and wrote on it this verse, Be still and know that I am God. It hangs above my little desk in my basement, my little study in my house in the basement where I will sit and write or read often. It's been there for many years. How many of you are familiar with that verse, Psalm 4610? Be still and know that I am God. It was, we sung it, we heard it. Most of us know it. It's on Instagram posts. It's on Christian cards, on postcards. It's on little flowery pictures on Facebook with uh, peaceful scenes next to it. You know, it's one of the more commonly known verses. Let's put it on the screen here. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 4610. What comes into your mind when you hear the phrase, be still? Stillness. What does that conjure up for you? Images maybe of sitting beside a quiet stream. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs for you. Maybe quiet times. For me, when I, when I think about it, I think about this plaque. And this plaque reminds me, makes me think of being in Ecuador. El Refugio, the refuge. That's the name of the uh, ranch and the ca- Christian camp we've helped to support and build over the years. I've been there many, many times. There's a, the, it sits at, uh, it sits the Property sits at 9,300 feet. It goes up to 11,000 feet. It's out near the equator. Sitting on that mountain ridge at 10,500 feet, looking down at the camp below, with my Bible open and the sun shining, I think of stillness. Most of us maybe don't imagine that, but you imagine some sort of scene where you're having your time with God. Maybe it's the stillness of a morning in your favorite chair, a cup of coffee, tea, or whatever it is you drink. And when you have your Bible open. Or but actually... Few of us know the context, I think, and understand, in which this verse is given. And I think if we do, it'll shock you a little bit. It'll also round out and give you a whole new understanding of what the, the psalm is really telling us. It takes on a very different depth of meaning when you understand the verses that surround it. It's full of encouragement for God's people, but it's not exactly a call to a peaceful, quiet time. In fact, it's saying something quite different, actually. So let's read together. Uh, Well, actually, I'll read. You can follow along. Psalm 46, the whole psalm, and try to make sense of where verse 10 falls and how it might apply to us. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The superscription in your Bibles, most of them have this in Psalm, that says uh, to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to the Alamoth, a song. Putting that together, the sons of Korah were ancient Israelite songwriters, worship leaders. They wrote this as a hymn to be sung by God's people. Submitted it to the choir master of the Alamoth, we think, is a reference to the tune to be sung. So unlike some of David's poetry, which later are put into psalms and songs for God's people, this is, from its inception, was a hymn, a song to be sung by God's people. Specifically sung by God's people in times of trouble, or distress, or hardship. We sing, sing, we're going to sing a great hymn at the close. We've been singing hymns massively put together by Terry and, and Sarah and the team to remind us they're chosen, put together. Why? To encourage our hearts, to inform our minds, to shape our theology as we sing them. The same is true of the Psalms, specifically this one. 
they wrote this for God's people to sing, to encourage them about who God is and what's true. A refuge when all around you is not calm and it's not still, but seems like it's in chaos. In fact, the entire psalm is a poetic contrasting of the violence and chaos of the world and the refuge and security of the presence of God. That's the first thing we'll look at here, the refuge. The psalm begins by saying God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He's the refuge. The word uh, very present, it it literally means, um, the Hebrew phrase is nimsat meod. It means uh, to be found greatly. So we often would say, of, like, so if someone's present, I, don't, I wouldn't say of you, you're present, you're very present, you're present. Some of you are more present than others. Well, that'd be a matter of pain. Like, you're, are you present here? Are you here or not? Well, you could be physically present in a place and not pay attention, I suppose. But what does it mean to be very present? Literally, the Hebrew construction means to be found present, experienced, attained that way. What the writers are saying is, In the midst of chaos and trouble, God is found very present. He's present, he's found greatly present. What's your experience? When times of difficulty or pain or trouble come, do you feel, tend to feel God's presence or his absence? Is he closer to you in your experience or further away? For many of us, it's one or the other. It's not a time when when we stay neutral about the presence of God. We either experience him, find him present greatly, very present help. Or we feel him distant. C.S. Lewis said that God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. The psalmist is saying, God is our refuge and strength, and he's especially so in times of trouble. Very present. The imagery is important here. He goes on then in verse 2. To say, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved to the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam. Mountains in Hebrew poetry were symbols of permanence and security. The mountain of the Lord. Big, solid things that can't be moved, you can count on the mountain. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord? Who will climb his holy mountain? The sea in Hebrew poetry, in Hebrew worldview, in ancient Israelite mindset, was the symbol of chaos and darkness and evil. So to say the mountains be moved to the heart of the sea is to say, literally, when all hell is breaking loose. When those things in your life that seemed most permanent and most secure that you thought you could most count on are crumbling around you. When the thing you thought was most solid is falling apart, or so it seems. This is a terrifying picture. how quick we are to abandon the idea of God's presence in those moments. I know for most of you, if I asked you about uh, God's omnipotence, is God all-powerful, you'd say? Yes. Is God all-knowing, omniscience, you'd say? Is God omnipresent? That was a little quieter. (laughs) And I would say yes, too. We know that, theologically. But when those things that we thought were most secure are falling apart. Our health, our job, the life of someone we love. The first time you you lose a parent or, God forbid, a child. When when the worst of the worst seems to be happening, can you say yes to the omnipresence of God? Is he present then? The psalmist is saying, he doesn't feel like it, but yes, he is still our refuge and strength, our very present help in trouble. Listen to what A.W. Tozer writes about this in his classic book, The Knowledge of the Holy. The doctrine of divine omnipresence personalizes man's relation to the universe in which he finds himself. God is present, near him, next to him, and God sees him and knows him through and through. It is at this point that faith begins. And while faith may go on to include a thousand other wonderful truths, these all refer back to the central truth that God is and God is here. Faith begins in knowing that God is and God is here. 
That's what the, the psalm begins then saying, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble, even in the worst of times, even when it feels like everything is crumbling around us. So in times of pain and struggle, when we're tempted to ask the question, where is God? I don't feel his presence. I feel as if he's abandoned me. Which of us couldn't express that at some time? We are to do what? Take refuge in him. Well, how do you do that? Well, one simple way would be to sing this song to yourself, to recite this psalm to yourself. God is my refuge and strength. God is present in this moment, even though I don't feel it. Because feelings are not wrong to have them, but they're bad guides for theology. Your feelings, your emotional state is a, is a terrible way to base your understanding of theological truth. Because they come and go and they change. God does not. Now the Psalms do tell us what to do with our emotions. Express them honestly to God, but it doesn't leave us there. God is our refuge and strength. God is our very present help. On the worst day of your life, when everything seems to be coming apart, God is. Now in the middle section of the psalm, the psalm really breaks up succinctly, perfectly, into three sections. There's a shift in the imagery. From chaos of mountains falling into the sea to the peace and joy of a river flowing through the city. This, this section we're just going to call the river. The refuge, section number two, the river. There's a key contrast here between the images of the sea, waters, and rivers and streams. Let me try to explain this to you, if there are those of you that may be less familiar. In the Old Testament, as I mentioned, the images of a sea and, the, and, and uh, uh, large bodies of water was synonymous with the abyss, darkness, and chaos. We read in Genesis chapter 1, right, that darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. The waters were a symbol of where evil dwelled where chaos lurked. In the beginning, darkness, the deep, chaos. And what does God bring out of that chaos? Order. By speaking into existence. And when we read in Genesis 2, the description of the garden, there is something flowing through the middle of the garden. What is it? What is it? A river. It becomes four rivers, actually. There's a contrast between the chaos of the deep and, and the waters, roaring and foaming, and the peace and joy and prosperity and life-giving flow of the river. Streams of living water, as it were. So we see this throughout the biblical narrative. In Luke 8, there's this crazy story about a man from the Gerasenes, or Gennesaret, where Jesus meets a man who's been plagued by legions of demons, and he heals them and casts them out. And the demons say, you don't, please, they beg Jesus, don't throw us back into the what? The abyss. Jesus sends them into a herd of pigs. I feel bad for the pig farmer. And those herd of pigs do what? They rush off a cliff into the sea, into the lake. It's over and over again throughout the Bible we see. In fact, in Revelation chapter 21, we're told that in the new heavens and new earth reality, there will be no more sea. Now, for those of us that like a peaceful uh, seashore vacation, it's imagery saying to the, to the Jewish Israelite mind, the sea was the sign of chaos and evil and darkness. And God is working against that. The river, we're told, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy habitation where the Most High dwells. Let's read verses 4 through 6. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, and the earth melts. What does this mean? A river whose streams make glad the city of God. This is describing a reality that doesn't exist. Anybody here been to Jerusalem? There is not a river running through the city, is there? There's no river. There wasn't that any. The closest we can come historically is during Hezekiah's reign, when he saw the Assyrian army coming to lay siege, and he dug a tunnel from a spring to make an underground uh, stream to last, outlast the siege. There's no river. I've been in Hezekiah's tunnel. It's not a river. What is the Psalms is telling us here? There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The city of God is Jerusalem. It's a prophetic pointing forward to a, a reality that's happening now and a reality that will come ultimately perfectly someday. It's pointing us to Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. 
Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The levels of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There is going to be a river running through the city of God. And this ancient psalm given to God's people to sing is kind of also gives us a hint of a prophetic vision of what's to come. But you see the contrast? Chaos all around you. Mountains falling into the sea. Nations in uproar and, 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 and violence and war. And yet all the while, even now, a river running through the, stream, the heart of the city. Well, where is the place where God dwells now? Where is the, what is the dwelling place of God? Heaven? Just, is he just far away? Is God off in heaven while we're down here in darkness and chaos? No, we're told he dwells in us by his spirit, that we are his temple. He dwells in his people, in his church. So the psalmist is saying there is a reality to this river running through the place where God dwells even now. And we wait for it to be fully realized someday. The streams of living water running through the hearts of those who belong to him by faith now. Nations in uproar. Kingdoms colliding. And yet... There's joy, there's security because of the river. That's what the psalm is talking about. The point of all this is there's a spiritual reality that's not yet fully realized, but no less real and true. John 7, 38 and 39 says, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This is all over the Bible, Old and New Testament. Zechariah 14, verse 8, And on that day living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it toward the eastern sea, the other half toward the western sea, in summer and winter alike. Isaiah 35, verse 6, Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy, for waters will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams and rivers in the desert. Isaiah 44, verse 3, For I will pour out water on a thirsty land, and rivers on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your descendants, and my blessing on your offspring. Come, all who thirst, come to the waters, and you without money, come and buy and eat. In Isaiah 58, the Lord will always guide you. He will satisfy you in a sun-scorched land. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. The psalmist is simply saying, though you look around and it feels like all is chaos and all is darkness and all is falling apart, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Not just someday, but right now. That's what he's calling us to know and to rest in, the psalmist. You notice that uh, in your Bibles, if you have your Bible, in each section, after each section of Psalm 46, off to the right, some of your Bibles record this, most do, uh, there's a little, uh, a little phrase in italics. It's the word selah. Do you see that? After each of these three sections. That's a, a, a word that's, its perfect translation is a bit lost to us. Most think it's, it's the word means, it's from the root word meaning rest. That it's perhaps a musical notation, meaning pause. Do I have that right, Dr. Strand? I've taught it, moved this. Pause or rest in the music, but also may have spiritual implication as well. That we not only pause in the music, we also rest and reflect on what it is we're singing and saying to ourselves. It fits perfectly thematically here. Three sections. The refuge, rest. The river, rest. And the last section, the rest. The rest of God. We're being invited to consider the sovereignty of God throughout human history, how God is so much greater than nations or empires or civilizations, and to rest in that. But it's in a, a peculiar way. Let me read verses uh, 7 through 11. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now that, that phrase verse, in verse 7 and verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. Lord of hosts is a fascinating title for God. Lord, in all caps there, is the word name of God, Yahweh. And the hosts, it comes from the word, uh, 
Martin Luther translates it, Sabaoth, Lord Sabaoth, his name, and his great hymn, The Mighty Fortress is Our God, which he based on Psalm 46. It literally means the hosts of heaven. It's, a, it's the warrior God term. The God of the armies. The God of warfare. The God who's at the head of the armies of heaven. That's the Lord of hosts. It's because that God, the one who fights for us, is with us that we can be still. It's because that God is with us that we can rest that we can have refuge. In verses 8 and 9, we're told to remember, come behold the works of the Lord. What works of the Lord? Well, let's go back to the way we think about Psalm 46.10, right? We think about it as, oh, probably, you know, the stars in the sky, the mountain, the flowing streams, the beautiful meadow, the, the peaceful deer, the dove cooing on your shoulder, you know, like, no, actually, that's not the, the, their Bible and the Psalms do call us at times to behold those works of the Lord. But here we're told to behold how he brings desolation on the earth. How he breaks the bow, shatters the spear, and burns chariots. That's supposed to give us peace and rest? Yes, actually. Listen to what Fred Sanders, Fred Sanders is perhaps the leading scholar on the work of the, on Trinitarian scholarship today. Um, and he writes an article on Psalm 46, verse 10. He says, Be still here seems to mean something like, Stop that infernal war racket, you rebels, rather than find a quiet place in your heart. The works of the Lord that we are called to behold are the mighty acts of a God who smashes armies to pieces, overwhelms the warlike with superior force. When God speaks in the first person in verse 10, it is to deliver the message, I am God, which follows the desolation bow-breaking, spear-shattering, chariot-burning intervention. So, instead of a peaceful scene from one of nature's quiet spaces, a better image might be a burning tank. Think about that. Be still and know that I am God. God says this to his enemies as much as to those who belong to him. He's saying to those who oppose him, you will be still and know that I'm God. Someday, and this happens historically. The Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the French Empire, and the American Empire. Come and go. They rise and fall. And God is sovereign over all of it. I, the psalmist is calling us to have a worldview that sees past the present moment of chaos and says we serve a God who's sovereign over all of it despite the chaos we see in this moment. He's the Lord of hosts. And he's with us. And you will not know him. You won't know him as God if you don't still yourself and recognize who he is. Seek him. This is the context for the command to be still and know that he's God. Literally, the, the phrase be still means cease striving. Stop struggling. Stop fighting. Remember when, the, when Jesus calls the Apostle Paul on Damascus Road? He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Stop kicking against the goads. Stop fighting me. Stop struggling against me. And what does God do to him? Knocks him off his horse and blinds him. It's not gentle. God is saying to us in this psalm, Stop! Stop fighting against me. Stop struggling for control of your life. Stop striving. Be still. Either vo voluntarily, because you love and serve him, or he'll do it for you someday. And know him. You cannot know God as God if you're constantly trying to wrest control of your life, if you're constantly trying to struggle to get a leg up, if you're constantly trying to win. Stop. Stop striving and know that I'm God. We look around at the Democratic debates and the caucuses and the election that's looming, and I shudder at that and tremble at that, thinking about what happened in our nation in 2016, what's going to happen in 2020. We read pundits saying, oh, it's going to be another civil war coming. 
economic collapse is coming. Another recession is coming. We look around at the coronavirus and we think about the, the uncertainty of even our, how fra fragile our health is. And can we trust any news anymore these days? And it's easy to get full of insecurity and fear and, and worry and be racked with it. And God is saying to us now, as he said then, stop. I'm still God. I'm still on the throne. It does not mean that in a snapshot of human history there aren't awful things that happen. But I'm still sovereign. I'm still in control. Can you trust that? In fact, the context for this psalm, many scholars think, is 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The reign of Jehoshaphat. When God says to him in verse 17, we'll see, we'll see it here on the screen. You do not have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. He's with you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow, go out and face them, for Yahweh, the Lord, is with you. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is what the psalmist is saying to us. Stillness, then, is not exactly the same thing as passive inactivity. Just let go and let God. It's, it's nor is it the peaceful, quiet time reflecting on God's love, although that the, the Psalms do encourage us to do that. It's also, stillness is also not necessarily the absence of external conflict. It is seeking refuge in the presence of God in the midst of chaos. That's stillness. So you can have stillness of soul in knowing that he is God while the mountains are falling into the heart of the sea, while the nations are raging, while all around you is falling apart. Isaac Watts wrote a hymn, and he put it this way. From sea to sea, through all their shores, he makes the noise of battle cease. When from on high his thunder roars, he awes the trembling world to peace. He breaks the bow, he cuts the spear. Chariots he burns with heavenly flame. Keep silence all the earth and hear the sound and glory of his name. Be still and learn that I am God, exalted over all the lands. I will be known and feared abroad, for still my throne in Zion stands. I think Watts gets it right. This psalm is intended to encourage God's people Challenge God's enemies and encourage God's people when you face things that feel overwhelming, insurmountable for those who trust in him. Perhaps if we were to go to the New Testament, a place where this truth of Psalm 46, 10, and Psalm 46 as a whole, comes home to the hearts of disciples, is in the story we find in Mark chapter 4, verse 37. To 41. Before I read this, just the context, you'll know this story. It's told in, in Luke's gospel as well. They are, the disciples that is, Jesus put out in the boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. And a furious storm comes up. These are professional fishermen. They've been on the sea many times. And it's so uh, terrifying that they fear for their lives. I've been on the Sea of Galilee with my wife in a boat. It was pretty calm that day. I've been out deep sea fishing before and with big waves. I can't imagine what it would be like to be, if, you, if you're a professional fisherman, this is, you spend your life on the sea to think we're going to die. And Jesus is doing what? He's just so cool. <laughs> He's sleeping in the boat. The juxtaposition of that, right? The Lord of heaven sleeping in the boat. The disciples freaking out. And what do they say to him? The disciples say, oh, look, we should be like God. If he's not afraid, neither should we be. No, they don't do that. What do they do? They wake him up. Don't you care that we're going to drown? And then we read Jesus' words to them in verse 37. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and sea. Peace, 
be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Who is it? It's the Lord of hosts. It's the God of Jacob. He is our fortress. He is our refuge. He is your, he wants to be, your very present help in times of trouble. Do you know him that way? Not as the God of theological ideas you think about or study. Not as the faith of your parents or grandparents. Is he your refuge, your strength, very present to you? He wants to be known that way. And you will not know him that way unless you cease striving and rest in him. Let's pray. Father God, you are indeed a mighty fortress, a refuge and a hiding place for all who trust in you. And we confess to you that we're frail, we're weak, we're fearful, and we're always trying to get control of things on our own, and it never works. So remind us by your spirit of just who you are, the God who fights for us. Help us to stop fighting against you and to rest in you. O oh Lord, our rock, our refuge, and our redeemer. Amen.